It seems as if the, the enemy is waging a little war this morning. Um, even on my way to church, I come here before I go to Ridgeland and I could not access the church or get to it uh, because of um, some things that were taking place. But uh, nevertheless, we're here. We, we've come to worship. We've come to, to seek his face and to, um, to exalt the name of Christ. So thank you for being here. And thank you for worshiping uh, with me this morning. Uh, we're going to talk this morning about unlocking the purpose of life. Now I realize that that's a pretty bold statement to make um, for me to be able to say we're going to unlock what, what life's all about. But, but I really believe that we are. And uh, we're going to end up in James 4, but I just preached this message and I decided that for you, I want to start off in John, and then we'll come back to James. So go ahead and, and open your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John. And if you would, turn to verse 1, verse 14. And here's the thing. Jesus sums up, and you've heard me say this, you've, heard, you've read where he said it, you've heard it all of your life. Jesus sums up all of the Scriptures... And really the whole purpose of our existence, really in two commands, and you know them, to love the Lord your God, right, with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbors or, and others as yourself. Love God, love people. And the argument that, that I want to make this morning from Scripture, as we enter into the Christmas season, and you probably wouldn't have thought of using James 4 as a passage or a few passages of scripture as you think about Christmas, but I think it's really important because when we get there, we're going to talk about the busyness of life and we're going to talk about the craziness of just the hustle and bustle of, of life and never slowing down and never connecting with one another and never valuing the time and the relationships that we have with one another. But I want to start off this morning by just honing in on the great length in which God has gone to not only reveal himself to us, but to bring us into this relationship that we have with him. Because here's one of the things that, that I believe with all of my heart, is that we have not fully wrapped our minds around all that was lost in the Garden of Eden. Meaning our walk and our relationship with Jesus and also our relationship with one another. And as we gather this Lord's Day in God's house to worship together, my prayer is that God would just speak to our hearts to give us a glimpse of what He's doing and where we're going. And in essence, kind of bring heaven down to earth this morning as we seek His kingdom and His will to be done in, in our hearts and our lives as we seek His face. So I want to start off with John 14 as we think about the Advent. We think about God revealing Himself to humanity. John 1, verse 14 Matter of fact, there was a Christmas tree lighting in Hardyville this, this past Wednesday. I had an opportunity to speak briefly. Um, and, and this is the very verse that, that I spoke or, or talked about just for a few moments. It says, The Word became flesh and He dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now there, there's three things that stick out to me. Three observations that I just want to make mention of. There's no way that I'm going to give all three of these things justice. But I, I, I want to, to just share these with you briefly as we think about our walk with God and, and, and how important it is. We think about the Advent. We think about God revealing Himself to us. And then where we end up in our reading and sermon this morning looking at James 4. So the Word became flesh. Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, is the Word. Literally, he, he's, he's the very Word. The Word was in the beginning with God. He was God. John will say all of that right in the opening of this Gospel. 
Colossians says that he was, was, was there in the beginning during creation. So when God said, let there be light, that very word that was spoken, Jesus was there. He created, he spoke into existence. Now I understand we can talk about the, the Trinity, and, and we're not going to talk much about that this morning. And, and I realize that's a very uh, a deep subject, but it's a very real subject. God has revealed himself to us in three distinct persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus being the Word is ultimately the supreme revelation of God. You know, you think about being able to know someone, and this, rela- this, this sermon really is all about relationships. When, when you think about getting to know someone, it's one thing to, to see their outer appearance. It's, it's one thing to, to see them walk by or see them on television. But when they speak... Or you're able to hold a conversation with them and their words are spoken to you. It it changes everything because you get to know them on a very deep level. And I want you to think just for a moment of what God, as far as the great length He's gone in our redemption process, because it says that the Word became flesh. I mean, if, if Jesus would have never revealed himself, if he would have never became a babe in a manger, if he had never taken on flesh, if the, the, the incarnate of God, of, of him becoming man, if that would have never happened, if you were to take your Bibles and rip out all of the New Testament, and we'd have never had the testimony and the historical facts of, of his life and, and the things that he said and the life that he lived and the miracles that he had done and literally the cross, and the resurrection. How much less would we know about God? And the answer is a lot. But yet, because He revealed Himself, the Word becoming flesh, it changes everything. And and even when you think of the Old Testament, the Word of God, God revealing Himself, Jesus showed up all through the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. And if he would have never revealed himself, and so let's just back it up even more and say, hey, you don't even have a Bible now. There's nothing but creation. Yes, God speaks through creation to the point, he says you can't look at the the stars, the heavens, and the earth and not know that there's not a God. But he has not only spoken through creation, he has spoken through his word, through the prophets, of all, and he has most importantly spoken through his son, Jesus Christ, in revealing himself to us. So Jesus Christ is the supreme revelation of God. The unknowable has become knowable. We're going to see that the unapproachable has become approachable because of Jesus. So the Word became flesh, literally vulnerable, and He dwelt among us. The word dwelt, the Greek word that's used there, literally means where we, the word tabernacle. You think of the Old Testament, you think of the tabernacle of God, He would come, he would tabernacle, he would dwell with his people. God would manifest his presence over the tabernacle, over the temple. No one could just go into the presence of God, only the high priest once a year, and even that, he was going in there with blood. Why? Because God's holy and He's he's righteous and you just can't just approach him. And, And when you think about... This passage in John uh, 1.14, what God is doing is not only revealing to us who He is, but Jesus is the go-betweener between sinful man and a holy, righteous God. And so... 
the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, meaning that He took on flesh where in the Old Testament, God was only approachable by the high priest, and He did manifest His presence, but it wasn't the pre- to the point where you could just go right into the very throne room of God whenever you wanted. And it wasn't just open and available to anybody. It was the priest going in on behalf of, of people, namely that of the Jewish nation, or those that have become proselytes and believed. But God has revealed himself to us and he tabernacled, he dwelt among us to the point to when John writes 1 John, he says, we touched, we beheld. He even says it here, we beheld his glory, but literally we, we got up close and personal. We rubbed arms with him. We shared life with him. We got to know God. And in that, In many ways, God, in taking on human flesh, made himself vulnerable. You say, what do you mean vulnerable? Meaning he made himself acceptable to all the things that you and I are acceptable to when it comes to our relationships, when it comes to life. When Jesus, when God came onto the scene, as you know, he did not come in, you know, riding on a a white horse. He will come the second time that way, but he didn't come in as, as a conquering king. No, he came in as a little babe that was placed in a manger, born to to what we would consider or call two modern day peasants, the lowly of lows. They they had no money. And he was dependent physically on them to take care of him. And then as you, you look at his life, he knows what it's like to draw close to people and for people to portray him and, or betray him and for people to, to take advantage of him, to people to, to lie about him, to be misunderstood. He knows what it's like to, to suffer for Something he's never, for, for when he's guilt, I mean, has no guilt. He knows what it's like to, to be called down a path that's not an easy path and not a path that he would choose for himself, but he's willing to walk down it. Why? What did he pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? Not my will, but thy will. He understands all of that. He equally understands what it's like to be forsaken by God Because when he hung on the cross, he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Meaning, God, I I, I don't, I'm alone here. God revealed himself. God made himself vulnerable to every single thing that we might experience on this side of the grave. Jesus, God, understands brokenness. And the purpose of that is that we might behold the glory of God. John says we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten Father. All of a sudden, the unapproachable is now approachable. You remember Moses on Mount Sinai when when God was giving him the commandments and Moses says, I want to see your glory. I want to see you. And and God says, Moses, nobody can see me and live. He says, but nevertheless, I'll let you see the backside of me. And even when Moses came down off of Mount Sinai, his face was just glowing because he was in the presence of God. And he just got like a glimpse. And you couldn't wipe the glow off of him. We have no idea what was lost in the garden in its entirety. But we do have a God in the person of Jesus Christ that has stepped up, revealed himself, been willing to be the go-betweener to bridge that gap to where we can behold the glory of God, to where when Jesus says the greatest command on earth is to love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, in essence, to have a personal relationship with him, all of a sudden it's acceptable. He's acceptable. He's, he's, He's approachable. It's something available. 
Because of Christ. Now here's the thing, we know this. Most of you in here, you know this. You've come to that place to where you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you're like, yes, there, there's nothing more important than my walk with Jesus. And I am so thankful that I don't have to go to heaven or a church or a priest or anything else to meet with God. Because I have the great high priest, and it's the go-between, or my go-between, or my all in all, it's Jesus. So, as we prepare for Christmas, and as we deal with the craziness that we find ourselves in, and we've been here for a while, the thing that God, I feel like, has been speaking to me personally, not only just this week, but certainly over the last few weeks and few months, is slow down and get back to what life's about. Loving me and loving one another. Jesus revealed God because he was God. He was vulnerable. And in his vulnerability, he brought the glory of God to those that receive and would believe. Now go to James. We have a funeral service this morning, or this afternoon after lunch, following this service. Um, a good friend, uh, a church member. Matter of fact, he was very active in our Ridgeland, I mean, campus, part of our Thursday night Bible study. Got a phone call Thursday morning. Just dropped down. Lord took him home just like that. And then having to, to deal with the, the reality of that and the aftermath of that is tough. Some of you, you, your pain of the loss of loved ones that you faced over the last year is really raw and here's the thing that God's been showing me over and over again your relationships with one another matter I'm thankful for the Billy Grahams of the world that get up in front of the multitudes and they proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ God uses that but I want you to know that it's not the Billy Grahams of the world that turned the world upside downwards for Jesus. It's the average folks like yourself. God has designed the gospel to go from one person to the next through interpersonal relationships. And it's not the fame or the glory or the platforms that any of us should look for in the church or even in the workplace. It should be genuine relationships that we may tell people about this personal relationship that we have with God, period. James says, come. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such city. We'll spend a year there. We'll buy, we'll sell, we'll, we'll make a profit. A lot of assumption there. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even but a vapor. Uh, it appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. Here today and, and gone tomorrow. It says, instead you ought to say if the Lord wills that we shall live and, and do this or that. Verse 16 says, but now you boast in, in arrogance. And he says, such boasting is, is evil. Verse 17 says, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it's sin. James says, listen, life is fleeting. And we can assume all these things that we want of what we're going to have in the future, but the reality is we have no control over anything. We don't know what the next moment's going to bring. All we know is that we're here. And I shared this with a group of men in our men's breakfast yesterday, and it's just something that God's been speaking to me. For so long in my life, it has been all about the process, all about where we're going, all about the next thing. 
and not about cherishing the relationships that I have right now. You think about the command to love God with everything you've got and love people as yourself. We will not love people if we do not slow down and make people our focus. There's always going to be somewhere to go. There's always going to be something else to do. There's always going to be things. But how do we expect to make a difference for the kingdom of God and even understand the purpose of life and the rhyme and reason of life if we don't value one another? I think about my friend that just, just lost his life this week. Many of you know it. Every Thursday night, we, we would have a Bible study, and, and in that, that study, we would, would meet, and these guys would hang around for another 30 to 45 minutes after service. 99% of the time, I would hang around for about five minutes, and I had to go because there's always something more to do. Now, I realize that there's, there's things that, that we have to do and places we have to be. I get that. But we have allowed the enemy to blind us in the thing we call rat, the rat race of life. And we've let the pendulum swing from one extreme to the other. And here's, here's what I mean by that. Is in one sense, we're just go, 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 go. And then in the second extreme, it's like fear, 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 fear. And let's isolate ourselves for a couple reasons. One, let's isolate ourselves because of what may happen. May we catch something. May we not catch something. You know what? I get it. And I understand that we should show precautions and all of those things. I am there with you. I, I get it. But we cannot quit living. And we cannot quit sharing life and valuing one another. And the other reason we, we isolate ourselves is because we don't want to get hurt. And so you think about life, we went from rat race to no life to rat race to just isolating ourselves, back to rat, rat race, back to isolating ourselves and avoiding one another, not slowing down and truly valuing one another. Having patience with one another. Being a good forgetter. Listen, I was prepared to preach this message and, and literally at 8.45 this morning I was dealing with a very nasty attitude from someone that, that should have never had it. And, and I'm like, practice what you preach. Practice what you preach. <laughs> and I'm not going to allow it to destroy me or to ruin my day. But going back to Jesus, He is God. But he revealed God. In his revealing of himself and revealing God, he made himself vulnerable. And in that, he brought us close to the glory of God. You and I or myself are called to be Jesus's here on earth. It's only one God who saves. We're not gods. But we're called to be the hands and feet. We're called to, to be the light to the world, the salt and light of the world. Many people will never darken into these doors. Many people will never open the Scriptures and read the Gospel of John. But yet, do not forget that God has given us a mandate to take the Gospel to the world. How does that happen? Interpersonal relationships. Meaning, that we will be the ones that will reveal God to people through our relationships. And the only way that's going to happen is we've got to slow down. We've got to make ourselves really vulnerable. And in that, for the hope of people seeing and getting a glimpse of the glory of God that's resting upon our lives, that the gospel message may go forth. Last night, I had an opportunity to, and it was an opportunity, I, I had to go to the store because my little one had a cough and, He's fine, but he's just, just a cold or something. And I said, well, let's go get some medicine for him. And I, I invited my 10-year-old. Well, he, I didn't invite him. He said, I'm riding with you. I'm like, okay. And so him and I were, were riding to Publix. And as we were riding together, 
I just glimpsed and I noticed over. It was just like it was, I mean, he, I mean, it was like he was at a theme park. And the Spirit of the Lord just was speaking to me. You know why it was like that for him? He had me all to himself. And he had my undivided attention. So the radio ended up going off. I said, what's going on in your world? I want to hear. And the reality is all he wanted was time. All he wanted was, was a relationship. You know, we can live in the same house with someone and not give people the time. Not hear and invest. You so say, what, 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 what are you trying to say? Bring, bring this all together. It's real simple. The gospel moves through relationships. We know God because of Jesus. We're to follow the same pattern that he laid for us. We're to make ourselves available to those that are around us and learn the secret of contentment. The reason that James is writing what he wrote in verse 4 is because we're always on to the next thing because we're looking for it to bring happiness and meaning in life. But it doesn't. Whatever that thing is that you're, you're this, this occupying your mind, that's consuming your time on the internet, whatever that is, it's not going to bring fulfillment. But I'll tell you what will bring fulfillment. Spending time with your Lord and slowing down and spending some time with people. Because that's what it's all about. And by the way, what is God ultimately getting us back to? It's getting us back to Walking with him and walking with one another. Because once the relationship was broken with him, I mean, the first children that were born to Adam and Eve, and the first one was a murderer. The relationship was broken. And we're called to be that. And so as you think about Christmas, think about your family, think about your neighbors, think about your church family. And ask the simple question, God, whose life do I need to get involved in? I think about Ginger, not meaning to call you out. I don't think, I think you're okay with it. I think about Colette. The thing that I loved about these girls, those girls, is that the thing that they desired more than anything with the church is just come out and hang out. Spend time together. You know, the church used to do that. I'm speaking to the church as a whole. Not just Red Dead, just church in general. Family. The enemy has done much to destroy that. And somewhere along the line, we've got to get back to that place. You know, I've, I've learned that when, and I do sometimes, and I confess, that when I allow podcasts to be wrong with understanding the signs of the times and what's going on and being informed, but you know as well as I do, there is a, a slippery slope of knowing and being consumed. In the chain of events that we've seen over the last few years, many of us struggle with that being consumed. But here's what I've observed in my own spiritual life. When I get consumed in it and it overtakes me, my prayer life struggles or takes a hit. And my relationships take a hit. I become a little bit more irritable, meaning not having enough patience. And I'm, I'm ready to see God bring some lightning bolts down from heaven. Not a whole lot of compassion. But on the flip side of that, when I take it in moderation and spend more of my time in the Word and on my face and in prayer, all of a sudden my, my prayer life is vibrant. And I can't get enough of it. Can't get enough of the word. But here's the thing. My love for people and the longing to be around people radically changes. When you think about Christmas, it's about Christ. It's about God revealing himself. And I'll remind you that God has given us the mandate to reveal him to the masses.
And it happens one person at a time with interpersonal relationships and taking the time to listen and to care. And it's not being a salesman trying to sell something. It's about genuinely loving and caring for people. It's just that simple. And when you, as well as myself, do that on a consistent basis, here's what we discover. You ready? Life really isn't that bad. And there really is a rhyme and reason. And God really is doing something. And then all of a sudden, the scales get removed from your eyes and you begin to see God at work all around you. I'm tired of being just in the fast lane. I want to enjoy deep relationships. And I have them. But do I value them? So we're going to close in prayer and give an opportunity or a chance for you to respond. Fathers, we just thank you for, for your people. We thank you for the church. We thank you for, for who you are. God, I, I just want to start off by saying that if, if there's somebody in here and we've all been there that, that doesn't know you and they feel like they, they are outside of, of your family, God, I pray right now that as they hear me pray that they know more than anything that you love them. So much that you have sent your son to reveal yourself, to, to pay our sin debt to where they can experience the glory of God and, and be brought into the family of God. And, and Lord, if, if there's any in here this morning that, that are there, Father, I pray that they know right now that, that all they have to do is receive we think about Christmas and receiving gifts. Christ is the gift. Just receive. It's acknowledging your sin and it's receiving Christ and what he's done for you on the cross. And Lord, we know that when that happens, there's a transformation that takes place. As your word says, that whoever would call upon you, your son, whoever would call upon you, should have everlasting life. But equally, Father, as the rest of us gather in here and we, we know that We've allowed the enemy to steal so much joy out of our lives and we've got to get back to, to slowing down and, and loving you and loving people. God, help us to, to do that. Help us to respond from the words that we heard today. And Lord, as we, we just give this invitation, as we sing back to you with praise, may your people respond, whether it's at the altar, praying and interceding, whether it's wanting me to pray with them or, or wanting to know more about Christ, whatever it may be, God, may your people respond with the leading of your spirit. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.